there and welcome. My name is Nat Ferrier and I'm the face and the human behind 40 No Kids Now What? And you possibly have asked yourself by this point, who is this woman? What's her story? Why is she doing this? If you have been asking that, then this video is for you. So if you'd like to know the answers, stay tuned and we'll get into that in a second. Hi, thank you for joining me. Before we go a little bit deeper, I just wanted to add a couple of little just loving, gentle warnings because we're going to talk about some sensitive subject matter in here and I'm going to talk about some aspects of my story within this which some people might find distressing, right? But in order to try and lighten that, I will try and inject a bit of humour in there because that's just a me thing to do. So hopefully that helps, but ultimately this is a chance for you to check me out, right? So by the end of this, hey, you might love me or by the end of this, you might be like, hey, bye crazy lady. <laughs> But that's fine. This is exactly the point for us to explore, right? So let's get into a little bit more about my story and, and why I came to be in this space and holding this work. So I sort of sit as this strange anomaly in the not parent space because there are a lot of subgroups in this space for which are very specifically niched and very specifically meet a certain need of each of the groups under the main umbrella, right? And the odd thing is that I am multiple of them at once. And in that respect, I'm kind of bridging the spaces. And my space in that respect is a little more, it's not as specifically niche -y and I try to have it be a little bit more open to the journey of challenges and holding them with love because if I can reconcile them within me then that tells me that it's possible to reconcile them within a space <laughs> right but the, the funny thing is like I just I don't consider myself in the involuntarily childless category because I did we'll come back to why but I did have a little bit of agency in my decision, right, to choose. So in that respect, I also sort of consider myself in the child-free category, but not in the way that some other people do in that some people who are child-free, not all, many love kids, but some are a bit like, I'm just not into kids, or for various reasons, I don't want them. I don't sit in that category. And so some of the groups that are in that category that uh, are a bit like, you know, if you've got any interest in parenting, we don't really want you here, we're just getting on with life. Like, in that respect, I don't fit in that category. I also fit under the headings of I've been a fill-in mum in life, I've been a stand-in stepmom at times, and there's a part of me that actually has always loved kids a lot of my life. I never thought I actually wouldn't have biological kids, but my life has taken another path. And um, this is the part where I contain my tears on the inside. And this is where we use a little bit of humour. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't in this, in this time around. It's okay. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, I'm quite, quite clear in myself that I do want kids to be a part of my world in future. Just not necessarily in a way that might be extremely high risk and extremely psychologically distressing for me at this time. It just feels like too much anymore at this point, right? But I'm quite clear that I would still be happy to date someone with kids. I would be quite happy to uh, have friends, kids around. I'm quite happy to work with and mentor kids at some point. Maybe, maybe, possibly if it lines up right one day, maybe I might adopt or foster at some point, maybe, if the stars align and something aligns with people but you know I've never kind of wanted the path of to be well at this point I was after my mum died when I was nine I was raised in a single parent family my dad did his best within that respect but there are challenges with being raised in a single parent family right and I don't necessarily want to do it by myself and bring a child into that scenario because I know it can be distressing and so, you know, there's things in that respect that I'm quite clear around how I do or don't 
uh, want kids to be a part of my life in future. And that's quite certain for me at this point. You know, I have a lot of clarity around that. Some people don't, that's fine. But yeah, so I always had been someone who, you know, when I was little, <laughs> I, I definitely was always into kids. I was, I grew up around farmland and around a lot of animals and we often sometimes had some orphaned baby lambs and calves and I very much found myself, it could have been slightly influenced by having a social worker mum, but I definitely found myself in like feeding baby lambs and took it very seriously, my role <laughs> in like taking care of these little rejected twins and integrating them back into the herd. I went to great lengths to work, you know, to go hang out with the, with the sheep and become one of them until <laughs> they accepted me to, you know, integrate my little kids I helped raise, lambs rather. Like I was very, I had that kind of instinct very young, right? And I, at one point there was having uh, th three Cabbage Patch kids a week by the time I was six or seven, maybe-ish. I later went on to work in community services as a caseworker at one point. And you know, if I happened to be doing that in real life, you know, actual child protection might've intervened at some point in that scenario. But in the world of the junior version of the Nattyverse, uh, that was, you know, all, all things go back then. So that was me as a kid. But then my mom got leukemia. She got really sick. Reality changed substantially. Uh, I woke up <laughs> to the realities of life very fast after that. She died two days after my ninth birthday. And unlike the lovely Taylor Tomlinson, who said that, cause she lost her mum at a very similar age, right? She's a comedian. She's got a Netflix, she's got a couple of Netflix specials. But she talks about her story of losing her mum in her most recent one, right? And unlike Taylor, who's like, oh, you're young enough in that that you don't remember. I'm like, speak for yourself, sister, from another lost mother. Like for me, I remember the whole damn thing. And it is like inception, man. It's like three levels deep between the top level of actually losing a parent, the second level of where it's like the matrix where you finally see how life really works and your sense of safety smashes. And then underneath that, you've got the reality where, because now you have to be chosen by people, right? And some of those people disappeared in my world. Like then you've got the abandonment trauma in the base level of inception that's got like a level of anxious attachment and it's got a level of avoidant attachment. The avoidant kicks in when I get any red flag sign that people aren't sticking around or aren't sure. And then it's like, I'm like, run forest. So it's like, <laughs> like it's the, the complexity of, uh, you know, I, I had that develop and go on. Uh, and yes, but despite Despite that having occurred, I can laugh about that now. <laughs> it's taken me many years by the time I'm 40 and uh, you know, 31 years odd to get to that. But I guess I decided around about, I had a younger brother, biological brother at that point. Uh, I had some step siblings come in later when I was early adulthood. But for then it was me and my younger bro. And I kind of made this decision around 11, 12-ish that I kind of wanted at least one of us to have the sense of a normal childhood, right? And so I was kind of like, I just wanted him to grow up with the most greatest sense of normality that he could possibly have in trying to give him the sense of a two-parent family in addition to the beautiful other carers we had and neighbours we had in the scenario who were very mindful of you know the same of, of wanting to be a consistent presence in his world and so in that respect without begrudgingly and I genuinely to my core like I was grateful to do this it's just me right I just I wanted to and I felt like I channeled my mum in a lot of my life I just wanted to be here for be there for him as best he could and take some pressure off with doing things around the house and with uh doing lots of the tasks yeah even when we were at school right even when we were at school there are times of which he'd We'd be, he'd be in a corridor, I'd walk down the outside and be very mindful of the fact that he was like big sister in me was a bit like wanted to if they were being slightly mean to him. It's like I wanted to go kick some butt. But then the mother part of me would kick in and go, don't 
emasculate him, just give him some chance to kind of just hold his own. And in that respect, there was a lot of moments where it's like I, I found myself thinking like a mum really, really early. And by the time I left home and was making decisions and lucky for me, I loved performing arts and I was very lucky. I worked very hard. I took out the performing arts award in year 12 and I got into performing arts school, but there was a part of me that was deeply concerned about leaving home at that time and, and whether my brother would be okay if I left and whether my dad would be okay if I left. And uh, bought my dad a cat <laughs> to try and help with that transition. But like, yeah, it just, that was, that desire was always there in me. And I hold absolutely no, some people resent having had to step in for parents in their lives when they talk about being fill-in mums. Some had worse scenarios or, you know, they didn't win the parent lottery. My mum was amazing. I feel like I won the lottery and was unlucky to lose her so early. But I feel like I have like a relationship with her still in a way, if you're into spirituality. That's a whole other measure. But um, I don't feel like she's absent in my reality, put it that way. And uh, I could tell you a thousand stories about that in time, but not here. Let's not digress. Uh, yeah, so I, that kind of continued into my 20s and in my 20s I played a lot of catch up because we just were unlucky that we had a lot of family <laughs> crises going on when I was young. There was cancer, there was losses, there was even my animals were all getting cancer at one point before I left. I, my horse got cancer from flopping his bits out in the sun, our cat got nose cancer we got it was just like it was a bad run and then family like we lost a lot of grandparents by the time i got to performing art school i was a bit fatigued and um between childhood at school between when i started to get a little bit of attention when i was at performing art school like there was several me too instances popped into my reality of a mental physical and this is into my early 30s as well um of a mental mental physical sexual and or when i got a little bit of momentum in performing art school of a let's try and impress you by picking you up over my head and accidentally dropping you over my head and nearly breaking your back which took 10 years to heal uh so that didn't bode well <laughs> for my voice and a few other things um so i had a bit of look i've had a bit of baggage to clean up in my life but somehow managed to squeeze some relationships in there and tried to do my best in there as well but i had a little bit of stuff to heal i was in uh my mid-20s to early 30s i was in a long-term relationship we did at one point discuss pregnancy and i did have a little period there where i was pregnant for a little bit and was very consciously aware of it right i felt it <laughs> as i did there was another one in life later and i was very aware of it but there was lots going on in his and my reality at the time in terms of he had had a sporting career breakdown, needed a hip surgery. It was a bad time and so we decided to put it off. We ended up later breaking up for reasons which I don't want to go into too much in, in these as much as I can avoid and try and respect people's privacy and, and legal, <laughs> be respectful. Um, but it didn't work, right? But at the time, like, I, I was very aware that I was. And I was very aware after we made that decision when it went away. And I suddenly felt very empty when I was walking, taking a walk one day, and then I got my period. And I had a brief sort of sense of sadness around it. But I kind of was just like, I was very just, um... I was just like a sports coach about it, right? Like next game, next team, next time, that's fine. And just kind of moved on. And because I sort of, I'm very spiritual, I had a kind of sense of, you know, this is gonna sound really weird, but it's like I used to wake up and hear little footprints running down the boards in the, in the house and all these little things. And I used to have these little imaginary conversations with uh, these little beings. And so, you know, I didn't feel like I was losing anything in that respect at the time. 
Uh, I had another relationship later in my early 30s, a very soulmatey one <laughs> showed up again. It was almost like when him and I met in a room. It was like one of those moments. It was like the Matrix, you know, how the energy in the new Matrix movie kind of like is like Poof! when uh, when Neo and Trinity come together. It was like one of those moments, like literally everyone in the room was impacted by this moment. They all turned around in a very <laughs> similar fashion. It was a bit freaky. He had a daughter already. We had a relationship for a time. And so I did my best to kind of be stand-in stepmom um, in that respect and do my best to sort of, you know, support their parenting and relationship and, and love her as best I could during our time together. And that was a beautiful experience. After that, there was another guy a couple of years later that I dated for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it was destined not to work. <laughs> We sorted out a lot of codependency issues in those couple of relationships and because of how the previous one ended and there was this theme, I'm just going to be honest about this and you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's triggering for you, it's triggering for you. But there was a th consistent theme in all of these relationships that both the men prior had a previous love of their life who they hadn't fully let go of and at some point she came back in, right? And then at some point I was out or I decided to be out because of that. And so by the time it happened a second time, I was just like, screw this. Cause it brought up so much control, dependency, jealousy, insecurity, self-worth stuff for me. So I'm like, I was all up in, in professional development space. I'd trained as a counselor and a coach by this point. I had a lot of relationship coach friends. And so I kind of took every opportunity at that point to dive into things and just kind of go, that's it. I'm gonna go like a bull at a gate, like try to <laughs> go towards my fears and sort this stuff out. And so for a while there in the process of that, I went a bit Vicky Christina Barcelona. And uh, in some parts of the LGBTIQ plus community, they call that being a unicorn. And I healed a lot <laughs> through doing that. It was beautiful, it was amazing. Um, that next guy though, and several of the guys I've dated since, when I mentioned that that happened at some point, it's a bit like, you'd think it would be their greatest dream, wouldn't you? You'd think from pop culture, they'd be like, oh my God, yes, oh my God. That's not how it really is <laughs> in real life. Actually, mostly they freak out. It brings up so much stuff for them. And then by the next day, it's like they're ringing me or messaging with an awkward message. And I'm like, okay, see ya. So, you know, that's happened multiple times, which might explain also to some of you why the complexity of, oh yeah, there's another reason she's single by 40 at this point. <laughs> lots of, lots of stuff to reconcile. But this one particular guy, so there was a little bit of codependency stuff. It moved f way too fast and I was very Sagittarian, like freaking out at how fast it was moving. I'd learned a lot at this point of like red flag, red flag, but we were intimate together. And he'd had two shots in it already. He already had two kids. And I think he figured third time lucky, right? So he sabot he, not she this time, he sabotaged the birth control process. And then I accidentally got pregnant and I was wild about the fact that that happened. Absolutely wild, but I chose to do it. So, you know, I can't be that wild. So um, I had to sit with this weird, awkward, slightly unwanted experience for a bit. And it ended up being incredibly healing. And I've worked through a lot of stuff about creativity and being paranoid about relational endings in my life. It's funny, it was like that was part of the gift of that experience. And you can think this is nuts, but as I talked to the little being around this, around why, <laughs> uh, part of their thing was, well, I love you and I want you to help heal this particular thing. So you can think whatever of that, right? But you know, that was my reality. <laughs> in that moment. And um, it, it, it came to the point where when I went to the doctor to be tested and screened and everything for that, this was by about eight weeks at this point, I started bleeding at the doctor that day and that was the end of it. A giant ball of cells fell out of me and that was that. So um, I, yeah, so that was, and, but the whole experience in the interim, again, I was completely conscious of it. I was very aware and it was really beautiful. Like I had all the hormones and I just was blissing off my head <laughs> that brief period beforehand. I was just very angry at the same time at how it happened. It was terrible. <laughs> Felt like the 17, 1800s again in the Scottish Highlands. So I was a bit like, I was a bit wild about that. So I had a very mixed experience in that respect. 
<laughs> reverse entrapment I, I call it today but yeah so those were my my experiences of being pregnant and um, so then I had a bit of a quiet period where I went a bit you know spiritual and celibate <laughs> after that for a few years and that's that's continued for a little bit really but uh, by 38 I was very worried about age 37 because age 37 is the age that my mother passed on right so there was a part of me that my entire relationship life was fighting against the fear of ending up like her or playing out what my parents did or ending up in any version of a similar scenario and it's still underlying my decisions that I'm making right now right but I had to get past 37 I had to get past that milestone before uh, at 38 I found out I had uterine fibroids on the inside and one on the outside of my uterus and the reason I was investigating this was because I could actually feel lumps and number two because I had insanely heavy menstrual bleeding uh, and then I was insanely iron deficient because of that and then various aspects of my health was suffering because of that and then COVID happened or the very start of it and then my doctors and gynes were very worried about my very low blood oxygen saturation at that point, which they considered an emergency at that point and getting my iron back up priority. So I was scheduled for a surgery for what's called curatage and a fibroid resection for the ones on the inside. There was debate multiple times or not about whether to do the two in one surgery. One would require going up from underneath we're getting really intimate now right and um, the other would have required going in from the side right so in the end because I tested with it not cancerous that backed off the urgency and the ability under COVID to be able to have the second one so what we ended up doing was having the first one but because the second one the big one on the outside was already it's dead in the middle it had a necrotic necrotic center it's losing blood flow um and has a cyst in there so there was concern around if it kept getting bigger the preference was to take it out right because and if they took it out then that would mean and this was the thing i was absolutely not expecting that would have meant the end the permanent end of my ability to carry a pregnancy full term which shocked the hell out of me right so I sat with it and bless maybe COVID just created that, that those conditions in the hospital system of you can't have the second one yet, no matter what you want to do. We can't do it yet. You don't qualify. But the first one did because I was quite literally up to 14 day periods at that point and nearly passing out on day one and two. So I had the first one. The first one was amazing. I had six months to wait until my next screening after that. And I had six months to think about the fact that my ability to have children had biologically had basically just ended. Not with my eggs. My eggs are fine. My eggs were perfect. So I could have, if I wanted to, it's like I could consider all the options of what I could have done with them. But in terms of my uterus, that was going to be the problem. I was not going to have a working oven anymore, so to speak. So I had six months to think about all this. I had six months to be on dating apps reconsidering what what am I wanting right now and who should I relate with in terms of my status and should I pick the guys who still want kids should I run away from promising that now like should I just go for the ones who already have kids should I go for the ones who don't want like what what th where the hell am I now you know it completely respins your reality so I had six months to think about that and grieve and I grieved hard it hurt as bad as losing my mom it was painful <laughs> as hell. Um, I can laugh about that now, but I was crying about it earlier this afternoon when I was writing a post on LinkedIn about it. So, you know, if I still have my moments. Uh, but yeah, so I had those six months and then by the time six months went past, I have this great wealth of knowledge from having worked a lifetime in, in health, in the allied health world, having a biological science degree and also from having worked in holistic health and uh, evidence-based aspects of that. And I had this beautiful gift of a lot of knowledge that I was like, when I was told that I might need to have this thing taken out, I had options that I was a bit like, uh-uh. <laughs> like if, 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 uh, if the medical world and if my beautiful guy wanted to, who was amazing, by the way, he really was 
excellent with my surgery and I love him. I'm very grateful for him. But you know, it's kind of always that thing of, oh, let's just cut it out. And I was a bit like, uh-uh, I'm quite certain that I, I can, I want to have a go at doing something with this myself, right? Uh, and I sort of succeeded because by my next follow-up, it's actually, well, the inside of my uterus was beautiful. And uh, this one, the fibroid had started shrinking, but it's not completely gone away. And it's taken its sweet time. I'm back to yearly screening at this point. And so, you know, it's a slow process unless something turns around that I'm like, oh, something's wrong. But by the time that it was shrinking, then the prognosis changed to, well, we can just let it just shrink back into the uterus and then you'll be able to like have a go at having kids. So what are you waiting for? Get back on your bike, love. Who are you dating? What are you doing? <laughs> just not the thing you want to hear five seconds after you find out that you're going to be fine. It's like, hang on, I just totally surrendered to this reality. Shut the hell up right now. Don't give me other options. I can't cope with this now. Uh, so that happened and that was kind of weird uh, and opened up possibilities again. And then people around me, but from everyone, from my GP to aunties to everyone was like, right, here's ways you can still do it. Here's options. Here's what you can do if you want to freeze your eggs. Here's how much it's going to cost. If you want to do IVF, here's how much it's going to cost. They just felt like they needed to give me the information. And as I sat with all of it and I sat with the scenario I was now in and I sat with thinking about the necrotic inside of this one remaining fibroid in my uterus not long having watched that episode of New Amsterdam where uh, I've forgotten his name, but his wife, sorry if I'm spoiling this for anyone who hasn't watched it, uh, but he ends up in a scenario, surprise, surprise, where he's got to choose the wife or the unborn baby and she's bleeding to death and they're in trouble. And she goes and the baby stays. But now that's a worst case fear scenario. <laughs> right? But there is a part of me that goes, okay, so one of two things happens if I try and grow a child at this point, either that dead thing in there miraculously heals itself as sometimes happens. Um, Lord knows my guy's tried to say, well, you know, people have babies with fibroids all the time. It can be fine. I'm like, yeah, but they all have necrotic centers. And what happens if it doesn't go the way of miraculously healing itself? And what happens if it rips open at some point and then I have slow bleed in there or some degree of scenario? And that doesn't thrill me because, you know, then thoughts back to my mother having checked out on me and the 31 years of pain I have been through in moments dawns on me of there is no way in hell I would want to inflict that on another human being and leave that in that in that scenario let alone thinking about what my dad went through and I'm like I don't want to leave a partner in that scenario um because I want like for me at this point like I'm back to like I just want a monogamous relationship right and I've been through a lot in life like I said I had 26,000 train wrecks of trauma in my life at certain points. And so when this started to feel like it was high risky and then I could feel the weight of if I was trying to promise a man whose hopes and dreams were invested in my uterus succeeding, like I had all kinds of panic attacks about the pressure of that. And it just started to feel like too much, right? It just started to feel like I can't, this is too much. And it was freaking me out. and. If it, if it went wrong, it's pessimistic, but if it all went wrong or if it didn't work and then he left me, he could be a she, but he, <laughs> like if they left me uh, and, and, and then they went to have a child with someone else, then I think part of that would break me, right? Whereas part of it with, with, at the same time, it's like if he had a child and co-parented with someone else, because I've done the step-parent thing, I wouldn't care. It's just so funny how your brain works in some moments, right? But it's just like as I started weighing all this up, it just felt like this enormous weight and all this pressure. And there are circumstances in my life that have always been the case as I've been assessing all of my opportunities that I was always like, not like this, not yet. I'm not ready. I don't want to pass on this trauma. I don't want to do this in this way. I want this to be resolved first. And some of that still exists in this moment right now. So I made a decision at 40 that I'm like, I'm putting it down. I'm letting it go for my well-being. 
I'm reclaiming my uterus <laughs> from everyone else's dreams. And I, with deep love and respect, I say that because I know that, you know, there's people in life who will have been invested in my dreams. But I was just like, I just need to just take down the pressure of this, knowing that I can be happy having kids in my life in other ways. I would prefer it to be less risk. And I would just, I'm happy for that to open up in another way at some point in future, right? So that is part of the part of the uh, how I got to be how I am today and I'm kind of not I stepped into a place of like feeling not apologetic about that I'm just like it is what it is and I want other people who are out there who have dealt with any of this like to know that it's okay like if you need to call it at a certain point that's fine you're allowed to do that and if you just don't want to have kids that too is fine there could be a reason for that. If you watch some of my other episodes and videos, you'll know that there's a reason for that. And, and that's okay. Maybe it's all perfect in the end, yeah? I just wanted to add another little bit as well in for if you happen to be in the category of involuntarily not a biological parent or childless not by choice, in those categories for any reason. <laughs> the thing that I so want you to know at this point, because I, I've talked to enough people that, you know, I've got a sense that for some of the stuff I've been through, it's also some of the stuff that you've been through, right? And I know there can be some moments where the grief feels horrendous and is a bit overwhelming and can feel a bit enormous and you feel a bit stuck there and there's this kind of roundabout of emotions that you can go through and it takes time to move on from that and to deal with that and there is support available to help with that and you're not alone there is this community and there are other amazing communities that can help you with that but I also kind of want you to know <laughs> that like there is an exit ramp from that stage and it's not permanent and there are good things that lie on the other side. Yeah, and, and you will feel joy and you will feel good and you will love life again and you will go on to do beautiful, amazing things again. Like for me, a lot of times in my life, clearly, you know now, if you didn't know already from this video, I've been through a lot of shit <laughs> in life, right? That a lot of people are just like, Mm, yeah, too much. You're too much for me. But that's always been the place. And I'm quite intelligent as well. And I had two parents and, and the men in my life, especially after mum died, who taught me how to do everything, right? So in that respect, I feel so sorry for men because like when they meet me, it's like, they're like, what can I do to give to this woman? She can do everything. Like, so, you know, I'm a bit of a challenge like that. <laughs> but I, despite all that, have had some amazing experiences in life and I've just found this way for myself of despite some of the really hard moments and there has been moments where I, you, you better believe there's been moments where I've been on the ground going I can't do this anymore I, I feel like I'm giving up I, I'm done and something in me always emerges from the inside and from the outside I think it's part spiritual and it's part me and uh, it's part the, the beautiful people I have around me that's like I always find that bit that you know like when a little kid falls down when they're learning to walk it's like no all right get up <laughs> haul your butt up and what do you love what are you grateful for what's still working what can you still achieve how can you still make a positive impact in the world like at some point I end up bringing it back to those things and that's part of the, the remedy and the recipe that, that helps you kind of keep going on, yeah? And so, you know, as I got to 40, for example, like, and I was taking stock of, of the decade prior, yeah, there's things that I regret, yeah, there's things that were hard and yeah, there was aspects of this journey that were terrible. But as I took stock of things, I also was like, you know what? I'm actually not unhappy. Like if I died tomorrow, I'm also not unhappy with what I've done in life because I've, I, I made an agreement after my mum died with myself that I'm like, I'm going to try to not live in the past. 
I'm going to try to go on and embrace life and live it as best I can at level, level 10. That becomes a matter sometimes of living with doing the best with what you have and being grateful for what you can do in that respect and or not surrendering to the impossible at times and going, screw that, I'm going to choose to make things possible. But, you know, I've tried to live to that philosophy most of my life and there are plenty of moments in my 20s and 30s where I'm like, you know what, you did your best to live with your heart on your sleeve, you went after the things you loved, you lived all five of the career paths that were recommended that would be your most compatible ones by the age of 40, you've had a go at all of them and you've still got opportunities to do more. I've wanted to make a positive impact in the world. I've been very fortunate to be trained by, to work with, to have had some amazing <laughs> opportunities in my working world, uh, in my business and in employment scenarios in the past. Some of them I haven't capitalized on as well as I could. Others of them, success is, is, a, is a matter of perspective, right? It's all about I think in the end, you have to be accountable to you in creating your own story and your own journey in terms of deciding, well, you know, what are my success markers for me personally and fulfillment markers and measuring yourself against that because, you know, you can cause yourself a lot of mi misery if you're constantly, I'm, I'm constantly surrounded by, you know, doers and high achievers and, and there's a part of me that's like that as well. But I need to be really careful not to, You've got to be careful not because you can cause yourself a lot of misery if you peg yourself too far beyond where you're at now in terms of going, oh, I'm not where Beyonce is at right now, or I'm not where McConaughey is at <laughs> right now, or whoever is your guru or your idol, your coach crush in your industry or in your employment world who you want to aspire to be. Like You've got to be really careful not to shred yourself by looking too far into what you don't have and what you haven't achieved yet. You can call, we can cause ourselves a lot of misery in that respect. So key is to not do that. But I feel like I'm very blessed to have, I've individually and collaboratively worked with some people to run a lot of events. Some of those were about leadership and about helping people find their way in business and particularly in the health world. I feel very grateful that I've been a part of helping bring together over 20,000 people in that respect and helping them to try and unleash, realize what their unique gifts are that they have to bring forward as leaders and entrepreneurs and helping professionals in the world and helping them find confidence and find their voices and own their voices and put their voices out there in the world and put their wisdom out and make a greater positive impact. I feel really grateful that I've been able to be a part of that. I feel very grateful that in those collaborations and in the things that I've run for myself, whether they be therapeutic or whether they were about empowering women leaders, or uh, non-specifically public speakers, like helping them, like I've run a lot of public speaking practice events uh, and networking events in, in recent years in my own humble little way. And like, must have done something right in amongst all of those because I've got some amazing feedback and some beautiful gratitude and testimonials out of that. So have made an impact in, in my own little way. So I'm not unhappy about that. And, you know, I do what I love on a regular basis. We're sitting in my creative corner right now. This is one of mine. This is that painting. There's another one over there. This one I've been talking about finishing for a while now. <laughs> I will get to it shortly. But, you know, I make sure I try and get in singing at least four to five times a week. I've got plans of doing open mic nights again. I'm still living my creative goals. I do things every day that make me happy. I do yoga and I, I walk and I do stuff at the beach and in nature and I, I, I'm single and I love my life, right? Like I'm not unhappy with, with me and how I'm at. I'm good with me. And in that respect, I think that can be a good reminder maybe to some people out there that good things are still waiting in the world, right? I'm just, I feel like I'm at the end of one cycle and I'm starting another one as, I'm, as I've launched 40 No Kids Now What. There's a new, there's a new journey alone with, with that going on. But you'll, you'll get there. And that's just the thing I want you to know, yeah, is that 
you absolutely good things can still come and but you got to be you got to be ready you got to be ready in your own time to create that but it's you that gets to write your story it's you that gets to write your adventure and decide how that's going to go in the end as well so in that respect i'm excited because i know that you know there's still good things <laughs> Ahead and despite all that's going on in the world and so you know I'm just sending you a lot of love and excitement as I do this and uh, yeah it's gonna be great if there's anything I can help you with at any point if you have any questions if there's anything my communities and work can support you with or if there's anything you've come to this and there's something you'd like to collaborate on or I can offer something to you please do reach out let's chat love to chat to you and uh, thanks for, if you've stuck it out this long, thanks for watching. Deep gratitude to you. And until next time, hope you have a beautiful day. Have fun. Take care. Bye-bye.